Justice, Jorge Castillo and Michael Skippa. Michael is the, you're the Public Affairs Director for Alcohol Justice. And we're going to be speaking with Natalie Hand, an actis, activist and journalist from the Sioux Reservation, and from Brian Brewer, who was a former Oglala Sioux tribal chief and one of the Vietnam veteran, one of the veterans who was at Standing Rock. Uh, so one of the things, Alcohol Justice, it's a nonprofit. You're based out of San Rafael, California, and you work to regulate the big beer, distilled spirits, and wine corporations. Alcohol justice supports the creation of laws that protect the community from the exploitative and harmful practices of big alcohol. Big alcohol is a really serious thing, and there's a lot of current legislation. Michael? Well, there is, Judy, and thank you for having us here today. Sure. It's a pleasure to see you again. Big alcohol uh, has had a lot of time you know, since the end of Prohibition and uh, unbelievable profits uh, to bully their way through most state legislatures as well as the federal government. And California, of course, is the uh, country's largest alcohol market. Why? So, well, there, we have more people, basically. Oh. Okay. We have more people, and we, ho we also, of course, have the wine industry located here, which uh, touches every county in California. There's a little bit of winemaking uh, so there's a lot of power right there. Uh, but they exert this power, and, and um, most noticeably in Sacramento, where they influence laws uh, that affect how alcohol uh, is served to the public and how it's uh, manufactured, distributed. Um, and we have a three-tier system here in California uh, that separates producing from distribution from retail. What and does that mean? It means that at the... Well, during Prohibition back in the 30s, um, there was deep concern uh, that led to Prohibition where you had large alcohol producers who controlled the product uh, from production to sale. There were bars on every corner, like we have Starbucks on every corner. Mm -hmm. You'd have a bar on every corner and sometimes six in between. And they were all racing to the bottom to sell a product uh, at a price that would bring more customers in. And this led to over con uh, con concentration, over consumption, and of course, uh, all the social ills uh, that follow uh, disease and, and homelessness and violence, uh, violence and, and lack of productivity. And you know, that all kind of helped bring about prohibition. But of course, it didn't last that long. And it ended uh, when the government realized that they were missing all the revenue from the taxes and it had all gone underground. That was the end of prohibition, not the fact that forces welled up to bring alcohol back to a legal status. It was because of the money. And it's still because of the money. Uh, big alcohol spends a lot of money at every state capital uh, to ensure that the laws they want get passed and the ones they don't like are not passed. So are you prohibitionists? We are not prohibitionists. We don't tell adults what to do in their lives. Uh, I don't think on staff there's a, a non-drinker among us. Um, but what we do care deeply about is the way the industry manipulates the marketplace, manipulates through advertising and marketing uh, to prompt people to overconsume. Especially they target young people. Well, they have to grow their market somewhere. So they grow it where people are young and get them introduced to the products, introduced to the brand names, introduced by selling a product that's very inexpensive because kids don't have a lot of money. And that's how they bring them in. And that's how they begin to uh, create a larger market for their products. Because at the other end, people are getting sick and dying. So they've got to keep feeding that, uh, that market. I want to interject one thing here. I, when I retired, I went to work for the Giants ball team. And I had, we had to go to a two-day training. Every bit of it was on how to deal with drunks because that's where they make most of their money, with the alcohol. And I had so, and, you know, call security. I had some guy spill beer all over me. You know, they're just so drunk that they can't, and violence and fights erupt. And the, there's this, you, they have a huge security team to deal with it. But they, had, they trained us on how to do it. It was really disgusting. Well, the sad thing is that the industry pays for no part of that. 
They don't pay for any part of that training. They don't pay for any part of uh, mitigating the harms that the products cause. Really? No. And, uh, you know, the, the disparity between what, say, California takes in in taxes and fees, which is about $350 million a year, uh, balance that, if you can, with the harm which is about $34 billion a year in California alone, $17 billion of which is government share right out of our you know, state, this local. Is this like for rehab? Uh, no, it's just to clean up the messes. You know, We're talking about um, uh, accidents, uh, violence, oh, yeah. uh, judicial costs, incarceration costs, uh, property damage. DUIs, yeah. You know, it's uh, the list of possible harms not to mention the physical harms that are done, um, is, is very long and very expensive. And uh, right here in San Francisco, if you go into uh, Zuckerberg, San Francisco General Hospital, uh, anytime after midnight, 80% of the people you'll see in there are there because of alcohol-related um, accidents um, or injuries sustained you know, in a violent confrontation. Uh, so we see that all across the country, and this is the way you know, this industry profits. They profit by urging people to overconsume, and they hide. it's so much fun. Exactly. They've had, since the end of Prohibition, to train all of us to think that you cannot enjoy any function, any uh, anything in life without a drink in one hand. And unfortunately, that leads to uh, a continuation of these problems, and those are the things that we uh, try to stop. Uh, with our work at Alcohol Justice. So what are some of the pieces of legislation you're working on? Well, it's an interesting year in Sacramento. Uh, to say the least, there are over 40 bills. Uh, most of them are nipping away at one piece of code or another that regulates the industry. And we, of course, are opposed to those. And there are some bills that are actually good. And we support those. So I'd like to start with just a few that we are supporting. Mm -hmm. uh, the good stuff, uh, I like to call it. And one is uh, AB 1221, which will establish uh, the Responsible Beverage Service Training Program Act of 2017. Now, you would think that by now, uh, all bartenders or servers of alcohol have to have a training to recognize when people are inebriated, how to recognize someone who's got a fake ID, mm -hmm. and turn them off. That's it. You're done. But it's not the law. Okay. Uh, in I certain, thought it was. It's not the law. In certain parts of the state, uh, localities have enacted their own uh, strong training programs, which they mandate, but it's not a state uh, mandate. This uh, program, uh, this bill, would create a state program that we hope over the years will become stronger and stronger. And um, everyone who touches alcohol, who dispenses it in any way, would have to be trained on how to do it properly and responsibly. Sounds logical. It's a great, uh, a great first step forward. D and you would be surprised at who opposed that bill last year because this is the second time they're going to try to pass it. It was the restaurant association, the oh. hotel association. Money, money. You know, they don't want to pay for their employees to get trained properly on how to serve alcohol. <laughs> So along you the same, got to laugh on that one. That's pathetic. Uh, a lot of this is it's 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 actually really sad. Um, but along those same lines, uh, there's another bill, SB 378, which would give the California Department of Alcohol Beverage Control, the ABC, um, the ability to uh, shut down a problem retailer, a problem bar or restaurant that has been over-serving or selling to minors or perhaps allowing some other nefarious illegal activity to go on. This would give them the ability to stop that Im almost immediately. They, Who would regulate that? Um, well, it would be regulated by uh, a judge, of course, would have to issue uh, basically a restraining order um, against that establishment. And the ABC would then be able to send in their own investigators and their own uh, enforcement personnel and and put a lock on that door. Uh, do some now, counties have this already in place? Mm, I, I don't think so. Is this, okay, um, I thought San Mateo had something, but they got rid of some well, places that it's were generally it's gatherings. A, it's a much longer process. It can take 30, 60, 90 days. They send a warning. Well, actually, sometimes it takes five years to <laughs> 10 years to close a problem location. 
And for those that don't know, ABC means it means the Alcoholic Beverage Control, the agency in California that regulates alcohol. But the way we have it now, once you get your liquor license, it's almost impossible to close a place down. There's not enough ABC agents to go out and monitor, and the complaint process is filled with loopholes. So would this bill bring more ABC people into give more jobs? I think it would. No, it wouldn't do that. It would just create a a way by which they could make the process go a little quicker uh, than the way it is now. Um, Well, I bet the beverage companies really want that one in place. No, (coughs) and once again, the Restaurant Association certainly doesn't want it either. But what this act would do um, is prevent potential violations, we think, and reduce alcohol-related harm, which is why we're supporting it. Um, A third bill, if I could move along, um, that we are supporting this year is called, uh, well, it's AB 479, and this would increase uh, the tax on distilled spirits um, to pay for the loss of revenue by removing uh, certain products um, um, feminine hygiene products and incontinence products from taxable products. So right now those products are taxed and baby at the diapers. state level. Yes, and diapers. And diapers, they're going to take the tax out of the baby diapers, the state tax. and For what? Uh, well, right now anybody who buys those products pays a, tax, a state tax on them. Yeah. This would take that tax off, okay, and so those products would become more affordable for many of the public. So it's a, uh, it's a tax uh, put forth by... Uh, an assemblywoman in San Diego, and she's uh, pro-workers. So she feels that because baby diapers and women's products are essential products that right. you need, yes. that you shouldn't tax them. Uh, okay, so, and that's good. Because, she, you know, the, like, for example, I just have a newborn. He's nine months. We spend probably more than $100, $150 a month on diapers alone, and plus the tax. Um, and what they would do is they would replace that tax by putting a two cent tax on distilled spirits. So you would supplement that loss of state revenue from essential items and replace them by. Who was the woman in San Diego? It's Lorena Gonzalez Fletcher. Okay. And um, she has a, a, a co author who's Christina Garcia from Bell Gardens, which is also in Southern women. California. Men, yeah, okay. It's a They're woman's. Uh, very Chicana activista. Yeah, there. good. Yeah. And, you know, in addition to um, increasing taxes to, to help pay for the loss of that tax revenue, uh, by increasing taxes on alcoholic beverages, uh, you'll also reduce a little bit of alcohol-related right. harm. And, you know, these taxes haven't gone up in over 25 years, so this is a great well, step. Well, the cigarette tax has gone – cigarettes have gone way up. They're like $9 yeah. a pack now. Sure. But so the alcohol would be more expensive then, too. Just marginally. You know, it's nothing like the the increase that we've seen in, in tobacco. We would love to be where tobacco is with alcohol. Because tobacco is sort of <laughs> for the same reason, to keep people from dying, right? Um, yeah. yeah, to reduce the harm. You know, a- uh, alcohol in general is more harmful than tobacco. Uh, in terms of cost, the costs are double, uh, which is hard to believe. Uh, tobacco is more lethal in the short term. You got two, three hundred thousand people a year in, in the state, I mean, in the country, dying from from tobacco, mm-hmm. and and maybe sixty five, seventy five thousand from uh, from uh, alcohol related harm. In California, it's ten thousand a year. It's one person every hour from, from alcohol. Dial some alcohol. From alcohol, yes. And One that's, person you know, every hour dies yeah, from alcohol. That's hospitalization, illness, accidents, Everything. domestic abuse. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty much almost an and epidemic. And the cities have to pick up the rehab. And there's there's not there's almost no rehab at all. That's just something that's. I wish someone would do something about that. Yeah, the funding for treatment keeps getting cut. You know, first you used yeah. to get six months of treatment, and now you get 90 days, maybe now 30, sometimes even just 30 days. 30 days is a lot. Uh, it's you know, hard to get, actually. And um, and it's you don't even actually go in. They, they treat, you know, you come in for counseling. Yeah, day maybe. program, like yeah. that works. Because you got those long, lonely nights. Mm-hmm. Well, let me mention one more uh, bill. Are we running out of no, go. No, just on uh, on the positive side, things that we can support. 
in the California legislature this year include a bill called AB 63, which extends the range, the age range for provisional licensing. So when a young person first learns how to drive, 16, 15, between 15 and, and, and 18, um, they get a provisional license, which means they're restricted for a year or Learner's so. Learner's permit. Kind of, but they even after they get that license for that first year or so, they can only drive during certain hours to certain events, mm-hmm. not with the uh, younger people in the car, or if there are, they have to be an older person in the car as well. And it's become very effective at reducing uh, teen crashes. However, what we see happening, especially with millennials, is that people are getting their driver's license later. Now it's between 18 and 21. Yeah. Um, where a lot of people are getting a license, and the law does not apply to them with provisional licenses. So this bill would extend those provisions to anybody under the age of 21 because they don't have the experiential knowledge either at 18 or mm-hmm. 19 or even 20 that someone uh, you know, at, at 16 might have. Um, so it's a, it's a good idea, and it will help to reduce. And they're drinking more too. Exactly. Um a quarter of all um, car crashes, uh, fatal car crashes in this state involve alcohol. Un- underage crashes involve alcohol. What age r- range? 16 to 21. Jeez. And that's the leading cause of death for young people, you know, drinking and driving, because they don't die of um, illness or anything, because like they're pretty healthy otherwise. So those are some of the good bills. Uh, uh, on the flip side, of course, there's a, a quite a number of bad bills. Um, like I said, there are over 40 bills we're tracking in California alone, not to mention uh, countrywide. Um, there are many, many more. But in California alone, uh, most of those 40 bills are negative, and we are so trying them. to loosen restrictions. Correct. And how can people get help? With, I mean, do you have any names or? But how can people work on this? Um, well, to take action on any of these bills um, in, in support or against, um, they're listed on uh, the alcoholjustice.org website, and there's an action center there, and um, you can see all the bills that uh, require uh, input from citizens, and, uh, we, and, and we would be happy to, uh, you know, to accommodate folks and, and allow them a channel to, uh, to express. Because people can make phone calls, right, to their reps? They can make phone calls, send emails, send faxes. There are lots of ways to communicate. Um, they can tweet and Facebook uh, politicians mm-hmm. now. Most of them have those channels of communication available. And all that can occur through our website. So activism is the real key. People, let's get busy because this is like, it, it's interesting. With I, I Also, what's the federal impact on some of these laws? Well, there given is, what's happening in D.C. right now, well, I think a lot of the uh, permissiveness, or uh, I would say, the energy to go after so many changes that would be negative to the public, are flowing from the top down at the federal level. There seems to be a lack of respect for people these days. It flows from the from the White House, and uh, unfortunately, there's, and alcohol uh, is big business. It is. So one they the, would be favored. It's one of the biggest. And they have a considerable power at the federal level. As What's well. the lobby? Say, like, isn't uh, guns are the largest lobby? No, I think the pharmaceutical industry might pharmaceutical, be. Pharmaceutical, <laughs> guns, uh, you've got alco- big alcohol, you've got energy, tobacco, tobacco oil. energy, oil, energy, and health. Mm-hmm. And now they have play. Especially today. Yeah. So uh, so there's a federal bill. Okay. Uh, let me tell you about it. Um, it's in Congress. It's SB 236 on the Senate side. On the, on the House side, it's called HB 747. And what this bill uh, attempts to do is reduce the alcohol tax, um, which, of course, hasn't been raised at the federal level since 1991, um, where it was adjusted marginally for inflation back What's then. the number? Um, the number of... M- the, the percentage. I'm sorry. The What's the tax? Is it 4%, 9%? Oh, you know what? I don't know. I don't know what it is, but they're they're trying to lower it. 
uh, with something called the Craft Beer Modernization and Tax Reform Act of 2017. Um, every year, the U.S. Treasury loses $7 billion a year by just not indexing that tax to inflation, so the cost of living. Now, nationally, we're losing $250 billion a year in costs and 65,000 to 75,000 deaths. Uh, and that, of course, is you know alcohol-related, violence, chronic illness, lost productivity. And it's time for big alcohol to actually pay a part of this. So we're saying no to this bill. And in fact, instead of reducing this tax, we need to raise it. And those are the funds that will help um, to reduce harm because mm-hmm. it can be earmarked for uh, for anything that uh, requires mitigation. And it's going to be a big fight given, you know, who the people are and, and – What's coming out of the White House? It's well, we'd just be big business. We'd be happy just to stop this. Uh, you know, we can fight another day to increase it, but stopping this is is most important. Um, but I, I I wanted to mention a couple bills before uh, we leave uh, this a uh, segment uh, that are coming out of San Francisco and that are very problematic. One is called SB 384 by Senator Scott Weiner, who is from San Francisco. Mm-hmm. He used to be on the Board of Supervisors here. He wants bars to stay open uh, from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. And this is just insanity. Um, with the amount of Scott harm... Scott Weiner? Yes. Scott he Wiener. wants the bars to stay open until 4 a.m. He thinks people need to be able to celebrate until 4 with a drink in their hand. And he said some really alarming things like party life matters, sort of mocking Black Lives Matters. He said things like if if we raise the hours to 4 a.m., the tragedy that happened in Oakland with the ghost ship won't happen. Why? Even, even though that incident that happened from? at 11 p.m. at night. Because well, he's saying that people will have a place to go. Uh, so he's really alarming us in his rhetoric. And his he doesn't get, I mean, people at those raves, they pay very little. And some of them are actually sober events. Yeah. I mean, and in a bar, you're going to be drinking. Jeez, where is his head? Well, it's uh, with the entertainment and um, alcohol industry lobbyists. That's where it's at. Uh, They're the people who will profit from this while the rest of us will pay the bills um, for the extra two hours of harm that will occur. And And one of the major threats we see is that you leave a bar at 4 a.m. in San Francisco and drive back to uh, some other county because their bars there close at 2, you're going to be hitting rush hour traffic on your way home. So now we're going to have it, we're going to have problems that occur around 2 a.m. happening in the rush hour traffic, which is a nightmare coming. So we're, of course, opposed to that, and we would love for people to go to our website. It's right on the front page. Take action. Stop Wiener's 4 a.m. bar bill. That's amazing. That's so stupid. Okay. Well, we I have a phone call coming in, so we're going to take a quick little break right now, and we'll get back to this. Thank you. May is Mental Health Month in San Francisco. There's going to be many events. The kickoff is Saturday, April 29th from 11 to 1230. It's free. It's at the San Francisco Public Library in the lower level in the big room, the Latino Hispanic room. If you're experiencing mental health and or substance abuse challenges, you're not alone. Young people are coming and they're going to be telling their stories, talking about wellness and recovery. There will be light refreshment provided. The third annual open mic, and that's May 15th, that's performance art. You can sing, dance, you can read your poetry. It'll be very interesting. This is also at the San Francisco Public Library at Larkin and Grove. But if you want to perform, call and make an appointment with Victor Gresser at 415-255-3651. They're going to be showing the movie Up. It's uh, Friday, May 19th from 530 to 8. And there are many events scheduled. Thank you. And today... Hi, this is Judy Drummond. My show is Connecting the Dots. I'm speaking with Jorge Castillo, Michael Skipper from Big Alcohol, and we have on the line Natalie Hand. Uh, you're joining us from Pine Ridge, South Dakota. You're an activist and freelance journalist, and you've covered, been covering the story about white clay since 1999. I'm going to read a little intro that, to, to sort of explain to the listeners. 
Uh, White Clay is an unincorporated town in the state of Nebraska that currently has only nine residents. White Clay borders the Pine Ridge, South Dakota Reservation, home to Wounded Knee and the American Indian Movement. White Clay has four liquor stores that bootleg 3.5 million cans of mostly high alcohol Budweiser beer into Pine Ridge. Gee. The bootlegging has created a health epidemic. It's estimated that 80% of families, 80% of families in Pine Ridge are affected by alcoholism. And one in four chil one in four children suffer from fetal alcohol syndrome. This is terrifying. For 20 years, activists have been trying to stop the illegal activity that goes on in the town, such as selling alcohol to minors, the liquor stores exchanging alcohol for sex, sexual abuse, assaults, bootlegging, and selling to intoxicated individuals. To make matters worse, law enforcement in the town is absent. There's nine people, no sheriff, right? Well, there's a local sheriff, but he only comes around once in a while, but he's... Uh Seems to favor the liquor stores. Okay, so Natalie, what do you <laughs> let's hear from you. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I've been listening intently about alcohol, and it's uh, it's quite a heated issue here. Um, you know, as uh, the great Winnebago activist uh, Frank Lemire said last weekend at a press conference in White Clay, um, every Indian reservation has its own White Clay. Mm. Um, we have many um, dry reservations in the United States that have these um, small border towns that really prey upon um, people that, um, you know, tend to have a difficult time um, Drinking, you know, they they can't socially drink, so um, they they have a higher addiction rate because it's it's just not indigenous um, to native people uh, alcohol. So it's uh, white clay has just been um, kind of called the skid row of the plains um, for for many decades. It's uh, a lawless little hamlet, unincorporated. Uh, Hamlet uh, population, I think, is about nine. Uh, it's down from, my, it was 14 for a while, but the numbers have dropped. Um, there Probably are alcohol cafes. poisoning. Pardon? Probably alcohol poisoning, yeah, okay. <laughs> there are a couple cafes and a couple, uh, there was uh, two grocery stores, one burned down, so there's one grocery store and there's a, um, a pawn shop slash trading post in in white clay. So other than that, it's it's the four beer stores that really um, drive the economy there. Hey, talk, tell me about the reservation. How how a reservations? You say it's dry. It's a dry reservation, right? Yeah. So Pine Ridge Indian work? Reservation. Um, you know, it was it was voted uh, a long time ago to um, not allow alcohol on the reservation. Um, so it would take um, tribal council, which is the, the the governing body of the of the tribe. It would take um, the tribal council to pass an ordinance um, making it legal to possess and or sell alcohol on the reservation. So as it stands today, um, it is prohibited to consume or possess or sell alcohol on the reservation. So what have you been doing? What What's going on to try to stop white clay? I mean, how can you stop white clay? Well, I think, you know, we've made huge strides um, this past month. Um, we had two Nebraska senators who really um, took a chance, and, and uh, one has even received a death threat for, for standing up to shut down white clay beer stores. But they uh, really pushed for um, these beer stores to lose their licenses. Um, back in November, the Nebraska Liquor Control Commission issued notice to the four stores that they would need to reapply for their liquor licenses, and they were promptly denied 
renewal of those licenses. So right after that, um, they filed, they went to uh, a judge, they appealed it, and on April 19th, the uh, Lancaster County District Court judge overturned the Nebraska Liquor Control Commission's ruling and said it was arbitrary. And immediately after that district judge did that, the Nebraska Attorney General stepped in and just halted everything and is, has sent it to the Nebraska Supreme Court. Which is good. So, Which is good. So until that time, the beer stores... Have to remain closed. They're not allowed to sell any beer. So, are the like is Budweiser or the beer companies? Are is there a lobby, like to pay off the judge or something? I don't know. Is that proper to say or something? But <laughs> yeah, we can't speculate on yeah. that. I, you know, I can, but okay. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's it's obviously you know the 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 money made is is uh, you know it trickles down to the beer stores, but obviously the corporations are the ones that really profit. Um, the distributor, um, they're all based in Nebraska. They they drove in this week um, starting on Monday and started loading up inventory from the stores and hauling it. Um, most of it went right down uh, south to Rushville, which is the, the next town down uh, the highway. It's 21 miles from the reservation border. So they took all that beer to a couple of the uh, stores there in Rushville. And that's also near a reservation. It's 21 miles south of the Pine Ridge Reservation. And so, you know, people that would frequent White Clay to purchase their beer, the feeling is that a lot of them will drive on to Rushville. How long does it, I mean, how, how close is White Clay to, to, the, to the res, to the reservation? It's like a mile. I mean, it's right there. The borders, it's right there. So people can walk to the store. Yes, yes. It's about a mile from Pine Ridge Village, which is the community nearest the border. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, this fight started about 20 years ago. Russell Means was one of the people who helped start the effort, right? Well, what happened back in, in 99 was there were there had been some unsolved murders going on in White Clay, in and around White Clay. And in 99, there were um, two Oglala um, men were found. Uh, their bodies were on the reservation side of the border, but just, you know, within feet of uh, White Clay. Uh, they had been placed there. They hadn't been murdered there, but they had been taken there and dumped there. And that really sparked um, a big outcry from people that, you know, it was just the final straw. And so there was a, a move to start bringing awareness to the lawlessness in White Clay, the exploitation of, of Oglala, Lakota people on the streets of White Clay, and try to to shut down the stores at that time. So so Russell and and some others were involved in in spearheading those marches and bringing in international media to help with that with the effort. What's going on in the reservations that people that eighty that would make eighty percent of the people want as al- be alcoholics? I mean, is there work? Is it what's the life like there? Uh, is it what's the reasons that alcohol has taken such a hold? Yeah, I don't know where that statistic comes from. Um, can, did you cite where that statistic came from? Uh, Jorge told me. Uh, yeah, it's it's been cited before on um, uh, newspaper publications and studies. It's eighty percent of the families are afflicted in one way or another by alcohol. Yeah, I, I suppose you know, in, in that sense, we're we're all affected in some way. But that could mean that my neighbor is an alcoholic and he keeps me up at night. You know, that doesn't mean that eighty percent of families are alcoholic. Okay. So I think you know that needs to be clarified. Um, certainly, there is a high rate of alcoholism. Um, there is a higher rate of um, children born with SASD. Um, That's the fetal alcohol syndrome. Yes. Yeah, fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, but you know I'm not a I'm not a doctor. I can't speak to that. But I, 
you know, I, I think that it's, like I said, I don't think that it's in, um, you know, Native people in in the DNA, they can't break down um, what is found in, in beer, you know, really? the, the makeup of beer. And I think they they have a higher tendency to, they can't break it down and process it. So This is science. This is proven. Yes. Yep. Because my family's Indian and Irish, and we always went, we were just out of luck, you know? <laughs> but <laughs> the Irish, too, but I don't I, know. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would just like to add to that, if, if you don't mind, Natalie, that yes. you also have to take into account the historical trauma, you know, that's taken place um, in Pine Ridge, um, the boarding schools, the inability for them to express their culture, their language. Exactly. The purposeful, systematic... Uh, alienation of the of the tribe and the inability for them to develop economically as it was imposed by the U.S. government. You know, it has a lot to do with a depression, I think, that's taken place. Oh, I know in yeah, my we, own family, the, the women hated everybody. I mean, it's a lot of hate and <coughs> anger. Mm. It's unresolved. And when I meant depression, yeah. I meant economic depression, I'm, but, but there's also emotional, anger, yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the economic depression um, on the reservation is is really profound you know we're we're living in a very rural area um you know the nearest you know bank for for us i mean where i live in oglala i have to drive to rushville nebraska so for me that's about uh let's see 80 mile 90 mile round trip so the government you know, that didn't give the reservation the, the best land huh well and they Pardon? took the best uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the government, she said that the government didn't give uh, the rest, the tribe, the best land. Uh, it also well, took away I mean, some of the best parts they, of it. They thought that, but now in this modern time, they want the reservation land because this is where all the resources are. Uh-huh. So what's under I, the ground? Women are, I, but certainly generational trauma is a major factor. To answer your question, you know, just piggybacking on what Jorge. Um, said is is correct that um you know we have a lot of trauma from the boarding school era that's been just handed down you know generationally and um you know people have lost um hope and so one of the the things that was said by one of the nebraska senators and by governor ricketts was that you know hopefully this these closures will bring hope to the community you know, and we need to do something positive with white clay. So women are leading this, right? A lot of, or a lot of women have stepped up to lead this battle, the struggle. Yes. There's always, I mean, women are always at the forefront of of every movement, and certainly in this case, they are the leaders, I would say. I've covered um, some amazing, courageous women that have been in this movement to shut down white clay, including uh, Oloa Martinez uh, and Deborah Whiteplume, to name a couple. So I I give them so much credit for just having the courage to walk into White Clay um, and stand their ground and and be the voice for the the grandchildren. Is it dangerous? The unborn. I think we also have to thank uh, the Nebraska State Senator, Patty Panzing Brooks, another woman, for being courageous and standing up uh, and saying, Nebraskans, look at what we've done. We have to take uh, uh, responsibility for this and stop it. Yes, and Senator Tom Brewer, who, you know, grew up in a border town. He's he's originally from Gordon, Nebraska, which is um, further east. Um, and south of the reservation border. And, you know, he grew up um, amongst Lakota people, and he he's um, really working hard. Um, he's a freshman senator, and he's received a death threat for, for taking a stand against white clay uh, beer stores. But, you know, both of them need to be, you know, acknowledged for, for having the courage and helping to stop the the blatant exploitation of, of a people. You know, it, I mean, there's so much going on in white clay behind the scenes and, and in the shadows 
for so many decades, you know, that the there's trafficking, human trafficking going on. There's women being murdered and raped and abducted from White Clay for decades. There's only nine you know? people there? It's just Well, those are the, the residents of White Clay that are on the... Those nine are, are the people that own businesses there. And there's one other family that I know of that live there. It's the are, gathering around the beer, yeah. Exactly. It's like a magnet. But, you know, it, like, you know, the argument, the, the proponents of, of the stores will say, well, we're going to find it somewhere. You, you're not going to stop the drinking. No, we realize that. But for me, what I've covered and what I'm passionate about is to, to stop all the, the other illegal activity that goes on in White Clay. You know, there, there are, in the past, there have been instances where there was, you know, sex trade going on for, for beer. You know, there, there are many accounts of women being assaulted in White Clay, sexually assaulted. So, you know, when we were in White Clay on Sunday with, with Frank Lemire and, and uh, former OST President Brian Brewer, you know, we wore red to recognize um, women that are being abused and murdered. And we certainly don't need that in our backyard, which is White Clay. I sure hope something can be done. Do you feel positive about it? I do. I You know... <laughs> You know, as Jorge witnessed himself coming back here to visit last week, it's an amazing transformation already on the streets of White Clay. They, the governor has, has created this task force. They had a state-funded um, group come in and do some demolition of some, some old buildings, you know, that hadn't been, you know, they were just decrepit old buildings. So those were torn down, um, the, the little nests as we call them, where the, the the street people would hang out and drink, those were all taken away. So there's already a transformation happening. You know, and then to not have those stores open and not see people laying around passed out, I mean, it, it, it really gives me hope. I really feel like this um, decision of the commission, the Liquor Commission, will stand and we will move forward and you know, encourage these beer store owners to to move into a different type of business enterprise. You know, there there is money to be made there on that border. Why not open a bowling alley? Why not open a barber shop or um, a movie theater? Sounds logical. Something positive. Okay, we have to go now because I think we've got Brian Brewer on the yeah. other line. Thank you, Natalie Hans, so much. Thank you so, Thank you so, so much, much for sharing. All right. Okay. Take care. So, Brian Brewer will be joining us uh, in just a moment. We'll take a little break right now. Too much. Visually impaired, come join us for lunch with the Golden Gate Chapter of the California Council of the Blind. We meet the first Saturday of every month at 11 a.m. at the Western Edition Senior Citizen Center, 1390 and a half Turk Street, across from Fillmore Street, San Francisco. We meet to discuss issues of blindness, support, finding workable practical solutions to your problems. For more information, call Mr. Foster Brown at 951 951- Nine zero seven five eight seven two. That's nine five one nine zero seven fifty eight seventy two. We look forward to seeing you at eleven a.m. on the first Saturday of every month at the Western Edition Senior Citizen Center, thirteen ninety and a half Turk Street, San Francisco. May is Mental Health Month in San Francisco. There's going to be many events. The kickoff is Saturday, April 29th from 11 to 1230. It's free. It's at the San Francisco Public Library in the lower level in the big room, the Latino-Hispanic room. If you're... Okay. 
This is KPLO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. I'm speaking with uh, Jorge Castillo and Michael Skippa from Alcohol Justice, and we now have uh, Brian Brewer on the line. You were the uh, former Oglala Sioux Tribal Chairman, a Vietnam veteran. I actually saw footage of you when the veterans came to guard Standing Rock, to, to guard the water oh, protectors. Okay. And you're joining us from Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Uh, can can you talk to a little bit? We only have a couple of minutes, but seven or eight minutes. But you know, treatment. What's going on? You know, there. Well, uh, we. Uh, oh, white clay is closed. There's no one up there. Um, really. We were, our biggest concern was uh, people that were living on the street. The medical conditions that they might have because of no alcohol. Um, but this is first of the month, and uh, a lot of them uh, get disability checks. So we're looking at probably the next few days, maybe next week, when they have no money and there is no alcohol. So I think that's when we'll really be watching for them. Because the effects will be hitting in, right? Yes, yes, yes. Right now, uh, uh, it's pretty quiet, uh, so I think they're probably taking care of their, their needs and their alcohol needs, but I know that's going to end here in a couple of days. What do you do? Well, we're hoping, uh, I went to uh, Rapid City and talked to the sheriff and the chief of police, and they have detox up there because we don't have it on the reservation, and um, they said that. What, what they said is we're one community, Brian, and uh, we'll take them. We'll take them. You just get them up here, and if they, uh, we'll get them into detox. If they uh, need mental health, we'll help them. If they have, uh, if they need to be hospitalized, we'll help them. So we really, uh, uh, Rapid City really reached out to help us, and we really appreciate that. That's wonderful. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, we are just watching right now to see what happens. Is this People the first time White Clay's been closed? First time in, uh, what, 113 years? I, wow. So this is, um, we're, we're hoping it's going to stay closed. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's our hope right now. I just want to say a couple of things in case we, the audience didn't catch it. Uh, Natalie mentioned that the Liquor Control Commission in Nebraska had denied the licenses for the stores to be renewed. So they actually closed on May 1st. And when she referred to Brian and Frank Lemire and us being at an event in White Clay, that was Sunday, the last day before they were open, but they were actually closed that day. So now there there might be a health crisis and taking place soon uh, because people will be need to be detoxed and uh, they might go into a health emergency. And Brian is trying to work to try to get some services. So and there's nothing on the reservation itself. No. We have no detox. We have no services. Uh, that's what's so bad here. We just can't get our, our needs met. The IHS, Indian Health Service, they, they can't meet our needs. Um, Bureau of Indian Affairs, they can't do it. Our tribe, they can't meet our needs. Uh, so we're kind of in dire straits right now, so we're reaching out for help. What kind of help? How can we help? What can people do? Well, right now, uh, I don't know. What this, we, this is something new that has never happened. Uh, so we don't know for sure what kind of help we're going to need right now. I think the biggest thing right now is uh, is transportation of how to get them from Pine Ridge to Rapid City. And uh, we're, we'll have to talk with uh, Indian Health Service and see if they can help us. What so about uh, like some, some Richie Rich coming in and building a detox center, a medical facility? Would that what, help? We, we need it so bad. Uh, we need a... a a detox center. We need a, a rehab. Uh, we need all those, all those things we need here on the reservation. Um, when they, when they leave for a rehab, they have to to leave the reservation, and uh, that's difficult sometimes to find places that will take them. Mark Zuckerberg, hey, we got a job for you. It's, this is really critical because the after effects of coming down of years of alcohol in your system, it's one of the hardest things in the world to do. Yes, and you know we have other problems here. We got drug problems, we have math problems, so we're going to need a special detox center that can deal with all of these issues that we're having here. Because it's just not alcohol alone. 
uh, drugs and plus maybe a combination of drugs too. So it's something that, um, uh, that you know, I don't know what kind of detox center it'll have to be, but it'll be have to be one that can deal with all these major. Yes. How do people contact you? Uh, well, by phone, um, uh, 605-407-8476. That's my phone number. My e- email address is O-H-I-Y-A-K-U at Gmail. Can people write to the Pine Ridge Reservation with your name on it? or? Uh, they would have to go to the uh, Pine Ridge. Pine, uh, Pine Ridge uh, uh it could come to the Pine Ridge Reservation. Could, they can put Pine Ridge Reservation, but there's we have different towns on a reservation, so it'll have to be Pine Ridge, South Dakota. They could also contact Alcohol Justice, who could contact you, right. which might they, be easier. Yes. yes, they can get hold of Jorge. He's right there. Mm-hmm. And his contact, uh, Jorge, is in contact with the grassroots people on the reservation, so it sure makes it handy uh, for all of us, all of us here. Okay, Brian, I'm sorry we're short on time, but we have to go, but thank you. Please, somebody out there, you know, tap up someone, one of your little millionaire friends. Oh, my God. This is going to be, I I wish you the best. This is going to be hard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge and Michael. Thank you very much. Okay, so. Well, thank you, Judy, for having us on board and on another great show. And we always appreciate you supporting us. And I just want to mention that Joe Pulliam is setting up Camp Justice at White Clay to bring awareness on the issues. Good. And please, uh, listeners, uh, take action on the uh, the nefarious alcohol bills in California right now. Go to alcoholjustice.org and take action. Thank you. Thank you both.